The 35 Confessional Buddhas The practice of the 35 Confessional Buddhas is one of the most long-lasting purification practices that has been propagated since the time of Buddha Shakyamuni. The practice itself was derived from the Mahayana Sutra of the Three Superior Heaps, which in Sanskrit is known as Triskanda Dharma Sutra. This text was originally spoken by Buddha Shakyamuni himself, and was taught within the Ratnakuta Sutra, an ancient collection of Mahayana Buddhist sutras. In a commentary by Nagarjuna, the origin of the practice can be traced to 35 bodhisattva students of Buddha Shakyamuni, who were implicated in the death of a beer seller's son. Having remorse, they confessed their downfall to the elder Upali, who was exemplary in upholding his monastic vows and commitments. They pleaded for him to relay their confession to Buddha Shakyamuni and to request a teaching to purify their wrongdoing. Buddha Shakyamuni saw that these 35 bodhisattva students were actually innocent in the case, but for the sake of future practitioners, he taught the Triskanda Dharma Sutra as a means to purify the downfalls of practitioners. One of the most famous examples of those who practiced the 35 confessional Buddhas is Lama Tsongkhapa. He is well known to have engaged in a purification retreat, during which he performed 3.5 million prostrations. This was made up of 100,000 prostrations to each of the 35 confessional Buddhas. In a pure vision he was advised by Manjushri to engage in this retreat, in order to establish a direct perception of emptiness. In the process of his extraordinary and intensive retreat, he left the imprint of his sacred body on the floor of his retreat cave due to his prostrations. Consequently, as he came close to the completion of his retreat, he beheld pure visions of the 35 confessional Buddhas and the glorious Buddha Maitreya, along with the direct or non-conceptual perception of emptiness. The Law of Cause and Effect Although karma is considered by many to be the mainstay of the Buddha's teachings, the Buddha himself did not actually invent the doctrine of karma. He taught karma, or the law of cause and effect, based on his own observations in a similar manner to how Isaac Newton discovered gravity, by observing the effects that gravity had on an apple falling from a tree. For most people, the effects of karma can be perceived and understood through inferential logic or observations based on reason. A simple example of inferential logic is when we see a column of smoke in the horizon. From that, we can deduce that there is a fire although it may be too far away for us to see with our naked eyes. Likewise, when we see inequality in this world, how some people are born in sheer poverty, while others are born into the lap of luxury, we can deduce that there are factors at work driving this result. That factor is karma. The different circumstances that people are born into are due to the ripening of different karmas from previous lives. If we look at this objectively, we will see that the reasoning of karma is a compelling one and can effectively explain why we go through different types of experiences. Karma in ancient Sanskrit means the actions or deeds of our body, speech and mind. On the other hand, the effects of karma are called vipaka or the ripening or maturation of karma, that comes back to us through the results and effects that we experience. There are many factors behind every one of our actions that determines their consequences. The most important of these factors on the consequence of our actions is our intent. The intent or motivation behind our actions is a subject that is much discussed in Buddhist teachings. If understood, this is the very point that can turn our lives around. The intent also determines whether the action is going to be positive, negative or one that is to be added to our store of merits necessary for the attainment of enlightenment. At this point, it is important to understand the distinction between karma and merit. Karma is ordinary negative or positive actions that have arisen from the self-cherishing mind and are motivated directly or indirectly towards one's benefit. As a result, 
Karma is finite and can eventually be exhausted, especially through purification practices. On the other hand, merits are virtuous actions that are dedicated with a selfless intent and towards one's enlightenment. Therefore, the results of merit cannot be exhausted and will eventually lead one towards full enlightenment. Although merit cannot be exhausted, it can be overwhelmed by the sheer amount of our negative karma, making it difficult for us to benefit from it. This again goes to show how important purification practices are, to prevent our merits from being overwhelmed. On the other hand, the law of cause and effect, karma vipaka, has an inextricable link with our previous and future lives. In fact, the accumulation of karma in each life determines our next rebirth, known as throwing karma, and the circumstances of future lives, known as completing karma. Hence, we can reasonably interpret what our previous lives might have been like, by looking at the circumstances of our current life and the interests we pursue. For example, a life of poverty is a direct result of miserliness, and to have poor health in this life is due to the harming of other beings in previous lives. Hence, the results always resemble the causes. Karma also has a strong effect on our minds and the way we operate. Unfortunately for us, negative karma multiplies over time due to our predominantly self-cherishing actions. Therefore, People are imbued with all manner of emotional and psychological afflictions such as aggression, greed, depression, and so forth. This leads to more confusion and conflict that increases our sense of dissatisfaction and misery. The principal source of our pain and suffering actually stems from the mind and our outlook on life. If we reduce harmful mental factors, for example, projections, expectations and mental afflictions. Peace of mind, contentment and happiness will arise. Confessional Practice In Buddhism, the holding of vows is an important practice. There are three main sets of vows, the Pratimoksha vows of a layperson, monk or nun, the Bodhisattva vows, and the Tantric vows for those with higher Tantric initiation. These vows coupled with commitments and refraining from committing unwholesome actions, forms the basis of an effective practice that bears fruit leading to spiritual realizations. Keeping our commitment to uphold our vows, is an integral component of the practice. Therefore it is important to purify the negative karma and imprints that accrue from our transgressions, by confessing them and promising not to repeat these downfalls again. In this way, we reduce or completely eliminate the strength of negative imprints from previous negative actions. The main component of purification is confession, which is to expose transgressions and lay them bare. Hence in Tibetan, confession is called shakpa or laying it bare. In Buddhist practice, Keeping our transgressions a secret makes it difficult to purify, and the negative effects of the misdeed will continue. Hence, exposing our faults is what confession is all about. Honesty and openness in all situations is the essence of Buddhist practice. In order for the confession to truly purify the misdeed, it must be done in accordance with the four opponent powers. The first of the opponent powers is that of regret. The power of regret is activated, when we genuinely see the faults of our transgressions and realize that they will result in negative repercussions. When we do this, we are filled with remorse. The second opponent power is that of reliance on an object worthy of refuge, in this case the 35 confessional Buddhas. Each of these Buddhas is fully enlightened, and therefore any prayer, prostration, offering or confession that is offered to them will result in purification and the collection of merit. The third opponent power is the determination not to repeat the downfall or misdeed. This follows the understanding of the faults of our downfall and that they lead to heavy negative repercussions. Hence, 
we make a firm resolution not to repeat the downfall. This leads to the fourth and final opponent power, which is that of the application of the remedy or counteracting measures to purify the karma. This is not blind penance for the wrongs that we have done, but instead the remedies are performed with the understanding of the law of cause and effect, and with the purpose of counteracting the negative tendencies of the karma that is being purified. The practice of prostrating or recitation of the Mahayana Sutra of the Three Superior Heaps contains the remedy in refuge components, and therefore if it is done with sincere regret and firm resolve not to repeat the transgression, it becomes a very potent counteracting measure to the negative karma that has been accumulated. The details of each of the 35 confessional Buddhas, the visualization, and the prayer text, can be found in the link in the video description below. In conclusion, the practice of the 35 confessional Buddhas is one of the most popular and perennial forms of purification practices. It is a practice popularized by great spiritual figures like Lama Tsongkhapa, who engaged in an extensive prostration retreat of the 35 confessional Buddhas in order to purify and gain deeper insight into the teachings. The practice of the 35 confessional Buddhas is considered one of the most potent forms of purification available for non-tantric practitioners. In order for the practice of the 35 confessional Buddhas to be effective, it has to be done with the four opponent powers strongly, along with the accompanying visualization. When it is done with the opponent powers, you are not just purifying the symptomatic problem of a few transgressions, but you are purifying the root of the problem itself, which is the self-cherishing mind. It is the self-cherishing mind that fuels our negative afflictions. Hence, the 35 confessional Buddhas is a very powerful practice to lessen the effects of harmful mental afflictions, like ignorance, hatred and desire, and thus allowing spiritual attainments to surface. Hence, 100,000 prostrations to the 35 confessional Buddhas is one of the preliminary practices Nondro, in preparation to receive highest tantric initiations. This is to purify negative karma as much as possible, while accumulating as much merit, so that when one is qualified to receive highest tantric initiation such as Vajrayogini, attainments arise swiftly.